I'm going to bring to you uh, a few thoughts uh, from Matthew 7, which is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, often people think the Sermon on the Mount is just contained in Matthew chapter 5, the, the Beatitudes, but actually it's rattled on through into Matthew 7. And last week, Dan spoke about staying on the narrow path. We say it differently. He says path, I say path. But we talked about staying on a narrow path in Matthew 7. And then we hit this conclusion statement, like Jesus brings the Sermon on the Mount into land from about verse 15 onwards. The Beatitudes are probably amongst the most profound life teaching we could ever hear anywhere. It, it contains within it everything you need to know to live a life that pleases God. And, and the amazing and beautiful thing about living a life that pleases God is that when we live like this, actually you can get peace as well. It's very countercultural living the Beatitudes, isn't it? I mean, who says things like, love your enemies? You know, bless those who persecute you. Walk in humility and meekness before all men and women. You know, these things are, are quite profound when we start to unpack them. So as a summary statement, what we have learned from Matthew 5 to 7 is what it is to be meek, what it is to be humble, what it is to stay pure and faithful and the profound difference that it can make, to not take revenge and to resist antagonism when it comes your way. I'm sure none of you here have ever felt antagonized by anything, even this week, but it's certainly out there to get us, isn't it? And the Bible tells us how to resist it. It tells us to bless those who curse us, love our enemies, even people who seek to undermine you. Every twist and turn, the Bible says to keep loving them, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Even those who seek to thwart you and cause you pain, Jesus says love them back. We've been taught how to pray, how to give to the poor. We've taught, been taught how to build your treasure in heaven which is essentially, as far as I can see, the people who are saved through our witness and doing things that please Jesus. We've been told how to let our light shine, to not hide our faith, to not worry about your life. Anyone here worried about their life this week? The Bible tells us not to do that. It says, do you remember? Don't worry. They even, God even looks after the sparrows. See how he looks after them? Why do you worry? Don't worry about anything. God's got it. So we've been told to trust God, not to judge, to believe the best, give the benefit of the doubt. And ultimately, if we do these things, the culmination of that is that we walk on a narrow path. And that's why it's a narrow path, because actually that's tough stuff to live like that. And I don't know about you, but most weeks there's enough stuff out there to want to knock me off the narrow path. Even last night, some young ruffians knocked on my window at half eleven, and I wanted to unleash my attack dog onto them. But actually, the dog is useless. I would rather hide upstairs. I bought a German Shepherd dog so it'd be a threatening attack dog, a man's dog. But no, it behaves like a chihuahua <laughs> with anxiety issues. Proverbs 3, 6 says that God will make our path straight. But actually, walking on a straight path means that we live this way and we resist those wicked urges of attacking ruffians when they come our way. And also in Proverbs 4, 26 to 27, it tells us not to turn to the left or the right. And then you might ask this question, but why, Carl? Why, Beachy? Should we live this way? It's really hard. Well, partly we do it because it pleases God. But also I do it because Jesus loves me. I, a lot of stuff that I've devoted my life to, I do it actually because Jesus loves me. And when someone loves you, it has a profound effect on you. When you know that a man died for you, we know you, you want to serve him, right? So sometimes I resist unleashing flick on unsuspecting kids because Jesus loves me. Like when there's stuff out there that's just chipping away at me, I resist it because Jesus loves me. And it, that doesn't always work, but it works 99% of the time. And sometimes I just have to have discipline and grit my teeth. Some of you would have been in meetings, even this week. I have meetings this week where 
you've got a, a difficult scenario where someone says something that's all chipped up and undermining, and then the killer statement flicks into your mind, which will destroy their lives forever and their careers. And you have to resist it, didn't you? You might not have been in that scenario, but it might come your way. And sometimes you just have to exert discipline. And then we come on to this. So Dan finished it at Matthew 7, verse 14. And then I am going to read the preamble beforehand because I think it's important. Beware, Jesus then said, verse 15, of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And in verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man. He built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell. And great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. But where are the false prophets, Jesus said? Now, this might astonish you, but you know, there was a, I was showing Karen some YouTube footage of this guy. Um, I've been to India many times, which is always a, a, a great joy and a privilege. But India is steeped in Hinduism, and, and which is a very complex and ancient religion. But they have gurus, and you see these men, particularly in northern India, but we also have it in southern India, these men who have, they hit a certain age and they reject everything around them, material stuff, apparently, and they wear the orange robes and they're, they're called saddus and they're like wandering mystical men and they wander around and they're held in great esteem. In fact, they travel the world and they have alarming numbers of followers. They often do miracles perform signs and wonders and they draw great, great crowds like you wouldn't believe. And One of the biggest gurus, Saddus, was a man called Sai Baba who died a few years back in his 80s. And at the time of his death, he had 50 million followers in his one equivalent of a church who would gather around him and follow his teachings. 50 million. That's huge. And in fact, when he died, he had $5.5 billion worth of wealth. There's a thing. And, and what he would do, he would, they would call them manifestations of like miraculous power or materializations. And so you would, you would come to him and you'd seek an audience. And then he would get his hands and he'd, every, every bit of footage you see, he always does this. Don't worry, nothing's going to happen. He would do this, and then, and then he would do that, and ash would come from his hands. Except, of course, it was well known that he'd have ash pills stuck in his fingers, and he'd grind them up while he was doing that, and then scatter holy ash. Or he would manifest gold chains out of his mouth. The people would come and see him, and he'd sort of gag, and then produce a gold chain. Often he would gag into a big towel, which contained, they think, a gold chain. And they, they had a diamond and gold chain analyzed, which was actually made out of plastic and stainless steel that had gold paint on it. Amazing how, how God would produce a plastic diamond. I've often thought that about a number of miracles, actually. But anyway, and he would do these things, and people would be 
in awe and amazement, including Westerners. Because we desire, like, God and, and the miraculous and we're desperate for something. 50 million people and people actually genuinely adored him. Although now it's come out since his death of decades of serious sexual abuse and financial impropriety and, and uh, the US government in the last years of his life issued a travel warning that, that, that particularly children, boys, shouldn't go and visit the temple because of the strong likelihood of very serious sexual abuse. And Jesus said, beware of this. Beware of the false prophets. People who come in the last days, basically saying, you know, look to follow me. Look for the fruit. And the fruit is actually countercultural. It's countercultural living. It's, it's, it's living in a way that flies in the face of the way the world would want to live. I'm, I'm looking to having a cheeky bit of building work done on my house soon. And, and I got Builder Mick round with a, with a planning guy to look at my house. Because I had a plan. Oh, I had a plan. I had a plan that would work that would transform my dodgy conservatory into one that wouldn't lose all the heat in my house. But Mick took a look at it with his, with his design mate and said, if you try and do it the way you're thinking, that's going to cost an absolute fortune because you're going to need massive foundations, like down to the Earth's core foundations, because it's Chesterfield and your house is built on rubbish. So, you know, if you're going to do this, it's going to be like, it's, it's a, instead, just knock your house down, effectively, as a conclusion. You know, you don't want to do that. Bodget and Scarpa might have said to me, yeah, it's fine. You know, just, yeah, yeah, we can do that. We we'll do dig a little trench and pour a little bit of concrete in, you know, and it will be absolutely fine. Until, of course, you watch your house suddenly start to move down the end of your garden. <laughs> like, if you're going to do something properly, you've got to dig the proper foundations. And so Jesus is saying the Sermon on the Mount is the proper foundation. So I thought, well, what's easy foundations? This is very simple stuff, but what's easy foundations for our life? And I, my immediate sort of hit list um, of following a lifestyle that's contrary to the gospel, I, I wrote down this, um, do what you want. Just live life to please yourself would be easy foundations, which is the spirit of the age. You know, do things that make you feel temporarily happy and that please you. Try and get away with shortcuts. And, and you know, any of you, I mean, I don't do DIY for, for similar reasons why I don't ice skate. <laughs> but, but I'd be tempted to take shortcuts and it doesn't work. Build your own treasure, financially and reputationally. Just worry about you looking good and populating your bank account. Look to your own interests and not those of others. Very powerful temptation, that is. I, I, I'm on Twitter, and the picture above my name on Twitter says, there is no limit to what a man can achieve if, he, if he's not worried about who gets the credit. Which the more you dig into that, the more you realise how profound that is. Apparently it was said by Ronald Reagan. But there's no limit to what a man can achieve if he's not worried about who gets the credit. I suspect he nicked it off an ancient philosopher. But I think that's quite a good statement, actually. Don't worry about your own interests. Give in to hate and anger. Let Lucy attack dogs on the ruffians. Think about how things affect you and not others. That's an amazing one. I see this at work. And I see it in church and I see it in society. People don't have a view of all the people around them. They're blazing a trail to the thing that most suits them. And they, use, they leave just huge amounts of destruction around them. We particularly see it publicly in the political sphere, where all the shenanigans, where, where people express loyalty and then suddenly the knife goes in. You've seen that in recent months. You're like, I, I don't know about you, but when I see that, I'm like, Ugh, that's really horrible. That's really mucky. But that's easy foundations. Don't believe the best. Think the worst of people as your instinctive reaction. I know none of you good people here would ever live like that. 
but believe the best and give the benefit of the doubt repeatedly. And I've often said to Karen, I've, I've made a decision years ago that I'm prepared to keep getting hurt. I made that decision years ago because very often I get let down. And you all have the same because people are people. I'm 100% convinced that there's not one person in this room right now who's not been let down by someone. And that's painful. Particularly when you give your heart to people like you do in a church. That's really tough. And the human response is that the drawbridge goes up. And we have the outward appearance of joy, but inwardly the drawbridge is up and you're never going to trust anyone again. And I can feel the pressures and temptations of that all my life, quite a lot, being in Christian leadership and charity leadership. But I made a decision years ago that I wasn't going to do that. Believe the best and give the benefit of the doubt, no matter how much it hurts. Gossip is an easy foundation because it just satisfies you to talk about other people. Judging, giving into momentary pleasure. Oh, do you know how many mates that I trained for in ministry in the mid-90s are now not in ministry because I gave into a momentary pleasure. Like a 20 second buzz. That's easy foundations. Living life to please yourself. When I was at the bank uh, in the city years ago, uh, we merged with another company and two teams of salesmen merged into one team. And one guy took me aside after a month and he said, uh, he said about my manager, Neil, he said, I don't like, don't like the new boss. He said, he's horrible. He said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do him. So I'm going to do his legs. He said, you watch. I went, okay, mate. And he said, I, literally what he said to me, I'm going to make him think he's my best mate. Make him think he's my absolute best mate. He said, I'll get him where I want him, and then I'll take him out. Do you know what I just thought? Well, how can I ever trust him? Well, that, that's easy foundation living. That's what it is. That's not building your house upon the rock. The key to pleasing God is to live according to Matthew 5, 6 and 7. Living the other way is to leave trails of destruction. And I bump into people, both followers of Jesus Christ and people who are not followers of Jesus Christ, who are, who are building essentially their lives on easy foundations and trails of destruction follow them. And pain is all around them. And broken and fractured friendships and relationships and problems and financial woes and all kinds of stuff. And yet, the more we choose to live with our lives built on easy foundations, the weird thing is, the, the more bitter and twisted we often become and start to think, actually, it's everyone else's fault but our own. That's the weird thing. It sort of numbs and blunts your conscience. But Jesus said, build your house upon a rock. And there's a reason. The reason he said it is not just about pleasing God. There's an inference in the story. And the inference is that the storms are going to come. Life is not guaranteed to be stress-free. There is a brand of Christianity that forces you into a denial of life problems. Like, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be happy days. Every day. You're never going to get ill. There's never going to be a problem. Your bank account will always flow with money. You're, you're going to get better looking. That's going to happen miraculously. Your kids are all going to go to Oxbridge. Like everything's going to be wonderful if you follow Jesus. Uh, and literally, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but there is a brand of Christianity that believes that. I actually believe that following Jesus healthily means you've got a good understanding of suffering and victory. That actually, we need a balanced approach. And we're not ashamed to teach that here, that sometimes life just hurts. And sometimes the storms seem almost insurmountable. But I've got a theory. When, st when stuff is really bad, actually in those moments, it's almost easier to lean on God. 
because everything else has been taken away. Often we get taken to a point of desperation where all we have left is God or, or you choose to reject him. You've got nothing. You set a few mates over a beer and you'll find that they'll let you down. So sometimes when things are really bad, often that's our moment of greatest clarity before God that we need to build our life on the rock. But I think actually it's in the small stuff where we're really tested. The small storms, the little squalls, the, the things that chip away at us. I made a list of them as well. Here's the things that I think force us a degree of course off the narrow path or, or you know, can, can really make our faith suffer, which is why we so need to build our lives on the rock. Things like a false accusation. I hate that. Particularly on Facebook or Twitter. False accusations of being misrepresented. One of you in your marriage is having a bad week, but they think it's you. Has that ever happened? It's always the other person who's being weird. Crashing the car. Not seriously, but just like driving into a wall or something, you know, when you're parking. Anyone else ever done that, those curbs in Morrison's? It really winds me up. I've d done that twice. And it's always really bad. Every, the last time I did that, I drove into the curb in the car park in Morrison's, and, there, and there's this old fella standing there with his cap on. I got the car and he went, hmm bit proud, isn't it, that curb? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The washing machine blows up. That's, why is that disproportionately annoying when a washing machine stops working, particularly when it's full of water? Uh, your flight gets delayed. You miss your train. Someone doesn't turn up for a meeting. Or someone lets you down. You realise someone's lied to you. Someone steps on your toes at work or gets in your face. Or someone's personality just majorly clashes with yours. I'm not looking at anyone. I don't think I have that here. I could go on, I think. You get the drift. Sometimes... We have a culmination of small storms that culminate into a big storm when they all come together. And if your life's not built on the rock, I tell you what happens. At best, you lose perspective and you go down. At worst, you spiral out and start attacking people around you. And you just leave trails of destruction around you. But if you know Jesus and if you're full of the Holy Spirit, somehow it just helps us to keep perspective because I do believe that we can access peace whenever we want when we know Christ. I think building our lives on a rock is good for us as well as it pleasing God. It means we can access peace because we realise that people are people and they're loved by God and they're all his beautiful creations even though the kids who knock on my window at half eleven. Now God loves them, doesn't he? I must admit, I, you know, part of me thought it was a bit cheeky. I can, I can imagine him going, hey, knock on the window. It's quite funny, really. A bit annoying, but. So I've just noticed that when I, when I really get my head in the right place, I'm more peaceful. When I, when I, when I truly start my day with prayer, I'm driving to work, I get to my office and I, so I get on my knees from my little sofa in my office and I ask God to be with me. Somehow my day's better. Sometimes my day is so insane at work, I feel like my brain is being sliced up. I just go into my office and I shut the door when I can grab a few minutes. And I just sit there doing nothing. I don't do anything. Just for a few minutes, I just sit there and I ask God to give me his peace. Because otherwise I know I'm going to lose perspective and I don't want to lose wisdom. It's just taking those moments. Got to keep perspective. 
there's some of you here out on the road. I just I caught Simon's there. And sometimes you're bombing around the country. Motorway service stations can become mini churches. Just stop in that car park, get yourself a Costas. Just going to get my head back together again. It's a really important thing, actually, sometimes to practice the art of Christian contemplation. And just to close your eyes for a few minutes and be with the Lord. And to remember our lives are built on the rock of Jesus. For me, Beatitude Living, I'll draw it to a close here. I've noticed that people who build their lives on the rock of Christ, they're the happiest people, actually. Often, they're the most generous people. I've noticed the two things go together. The happiest people are the most generous people. The meanest people, or the most tired people, often the most miserable, actually. Here's a, t- here's a tip. Write a check out this week for something. Give something. Give time or money or space to something. The happiest, most godly, peaceful people I know are prepared to lose. Prepared to lose an argument for the sake of peace because you're secure inside. You're prepared to look stupid on the ice skating rink because you're not worried about your reputation. Actually, competition becomes about spurring each other on, like Hebrews 10. Like we want to give, it all, give everything our all, but we're cheering each other on. The happier, most peaceful people are gracious. They're slow to anger and rich in love. We're not cruel. We're not cruel with our words. Actually, our predominant thought is kindness, which sounds like a weak word, but it's not. Being kind is incredibly powerful. That's why I have a policy, you'll notice, I never knock anyone in a vicious way from the front. I don't knock another man or woman's ministry from Twitter or Facebook. I choose to, my words to be objective about something like Sai Baba, but I choose to say kind things because I think that's what comes from living your life on the rock of Christ. It's important because I know that God's got it. God's got our lives in his hands. I think if you've got Christ as your foundation, you know that the last page has got a happy ending. And it's all going to be all right. So we can be secure. And not worry about people being chipped up around you. It's okay. I think you can journey through life with peace. Because one thing is absolutely certain. No storm can wash away the rock of Jesus Christ. At all. If your life is built on him, no matter what you face, it'll be okay in the end. And as I keep saying repeatedly, because I think it's so important, one day we will die and we will be in heaven together or on a new earth to be theologically correct. And we will be home together and it will be as if we've woken up from a dream and all the ups and downs and weirdness and pain and joy It'll be as if we've woken up from a dream. It'll be with Christ, which will be a beautiful day.